Joe Biden is officially sworn in as the 46th President of the United States of America, Thursday, January 21, Manila time. The 78-year-old Democrat takes his oath of office before U.S. Chief Justice John Roberts, placing his hand on an heirloom Bible that has been in the Biden family for more than a century. Biden takes the helm of a deeply divided nation amid a raging coronavirus pandemic that has infected over 24 million Americans and killed over 411,000 others. Through a crucible for the ages, America has been tested anew and America has risen to the challenge. Today, we celebrate the triumph not of a candidate, but of a cause, the cause of democracy. And at this hour, my friends, democracy has prevailed. Kamala Harris is also sworn in as the first female, the first black, and the first South Asian vice president of the U.S. Harris takes an oath before U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, the court's first Latina member. Poet Amanda Gorman reads The Hill We Climb, a stirring piece that speaks of hope and unity while acknowledging the difficulties the U.S. faces. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. After the ceremonies, Biden immediately resets the U.S.'s response to the COVID-19 crisis. As part of a first sweep of executive actions, Biden orders all federal employees wear masks and make face coverings mandatory on federal property. He also establishes a new White House office to coordinate the coronavirus response and halt the withdrawal of the U.S. from the World Health Organization. The order fulfills Biden's campaign promise to make COVID-19 relief a top priority, a sharp divergence from former President Donald Trump administration's pandemic response. Biden's press secretary Jen Psaki, meanwhile, holds her first news conference seven hours after Biden's inauguration, vowing to bring truth and transparency back to government. I have deep respect for the role of a free and independent press in our democracy. There will be moments when we disagree, and there will certainly be days where we disagree uh, for extensive parts of the briefing even perhaps. But we have a common goal, which is sharing accurate information with the American people. Meantime, the recently updated website for Biden's White House carries a secret invitation for tech specialists savvy enough to find it. Hidden in the HTML code on the White House website is an invitation to join the U.S. Digital Service, a technology unit within the White House. The message says, if you're reading this, we need your help building back better. The Justice Department, or DOJ, clear Senator Coco Pimentel of breaching quarantine last year. In March 2020, Pimentel went to the Makati Medical Center to accompany his wife who was about to give birth. Critics claim the senator violated protocols because he took a COVID-19 test just days before going to the hospital. His COVID-19 test result turned out positive. In a statement, the DOG argues Pimentel is not a public health authority and is not obliged to report on the Republic Act 11332. Such a law punishes the non-cooperation of certain people in a health crisis. But this is the same law that the DOJ uses to warn quarantine violators of warrantless arrests. Justice Secretary Minardo Guevara said in March last year, quarantine violators can be charged under Section 9 of the law. Thousands were arrested and many more suffered from prolonged detention for breaching quarantine rules. In a statement, Pimentel says the DOJ decision is unassailable and correct. But Rico Kicho, the lawyer who filed the complaint against the senator, says this sends out the message that ordinary people must suffer the full extent of the law while those in power get a free pass. In other news, the Philippines is set to receive its first doses of a COVID-19 vaccine from the Gavi Vaccine Alliance COVAX facility within the first quarter of 2021. Vaccines are Carlito Galvez Jr. and Health Secretary Francisco Duque III confirmed this Wednesday, January 20. Partilist group Duterte Youth calls on the Defense Department, or DND, to also terminate its accord with the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, or PUP. This comes almost a week after the Duterte government ended its 1989 accord with the University of the Philippines, or UP. 
Before the termination, the accord prevented state forces from entering its campuses without coordinating with the UP administration. Representative Duchel Cardema says the accord with the government gave the two state universities special treatment. She says it has been abused by some radical leftist groups to promote the youth recruitment of communists in their campuses. The PUP DND agreement, also known as the Prudente Ramos Accord, was signed in 1990 by then PUP President Nemesha Prudente with then Defense Chief Fidel Ramos. Youth groups staged a rally at the PUP campus in Santa Mesa, Manila, Wednesday, January 20, opposing Cardema's call. Meantime, Senator Joel Villanueva on Wednesday files a bill that seeks to institutionalize the UP DND Accord. He says it is their role as legislators to ensure that the spirit of the 1989 Accord is protected and set in stone to protect students from unreasonable state intrusion. Villanueva, a member of the UP Board of Regents, stresses the importance of maintaining academic freedom in UP. Senator Amy Marcos still holds a grudge against Facebook for its takedown of pages linked to her and her family in 2019. She claims her family had no control over the social media accounts. At a hearing of the Senate Electoral Reforms Committee on Wednesday, January 20, the daughter of late dictator Ferdinand Marcos says they were mystified as to why the takedown happened. She insists the pages were basic fan pages and in the midst of a campaign, it is natural that their actions were probably coordinated. Facebook defines coordinated inauthentic behavior as the use of multiple Facebook or Instagram assets for misrepresentation, use of fake accounts, and artificial boosting of content popularity. While the senator says the takedown happened in 2019, Facebook announced only one takedown of a Marcos Link disinformation network in September 2020. It is not clear if she is referring to the same thing. Facebook said around 30 accounts were created in March and April 2019, all of them focusing on the senator who was then running for the Senate. That same network was found to have origins in China and attacked critics of the government including opposition senators, broadcaster ABS-CBN, and news website Rappler. In the same Senate hearing, Marcos questions why Facebook partnered with Rappler and Verifiles as fact-checkers. In response, Rappler says it was Facebook that exposed the Chinese network link to the senator. Rappler adds, What Ms. Marcos chose not to admit is the ample documentation of lies and dangerous claims that were spread by these networks and which served to revise Philippine history and promote her family. Former Cambridge Analytica employee turned whistleblower Brittany Kayser earlier revealed the former vice presidential candidate Bongbong Marcos approached the highly scrutinized political data company to rebrand the family's image on social media. Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny is spending his days under strict control in a VIP cell in one of Moscow's most infamous jails. He was detained on Sunday, January 17, after flying back to Russia for the first time after being poisoned with a nerve agent. The prison is called Matroskaya Teshina or Sailor Silence. It houses high-ranking prisoners the authorities wanted to cut off from the outside world since the Soviet era. Navalny is being held in a 30-day pretrial detention order for failing to check in with parole authorities over a suspended prison sentence. He says the fraud case was trumped up. Olga Romanova, head of a prisoners' rights group in Russia, says putting Navalny in jail is proof that he is a very serious prisoner. <laughs>